Welcome back. The jury trial for Darrell Brooks is off to a rocky start this week. He, of course, is the man facing dozens of murder and other charges in the Waukesha Parade Massacre. Jury selection alone started Monday and lasted till Thursday, due in no small part to Brooks' repeated interruptions and unpredictable behavior. We're going to take a minute to look back at some of those moments. I do not. That's the fourth interruption. I do not understand. I would like to actually get to some of the merits of the things that you raised yesterday. So if you'd like to stop interrupting me, I will do that. And that, can that be verified, Your Honor, by law? Can that be verified? Because I do not give consent to not being present in any proceedings, which it is my constitutional right to be present. Your uh, objection is noted for the record, sir. Can you show me verification of that case law that you just cited that I can be present and not be present? Sir, I've made my findings. We have rules of decorum and courtesy. They have been provided to you multiple times. They are part of the materials that you have before you. Do they fall under the first amendment? Mr. Brooks, form, I, do, I am do giving you some leeway. You continue to talk over me. It's, uh, you please, I'm asking you to follow the rules of civility. Simple rule, sir. Don't interrupt me. All right, criminal defense attorney Chris Penn Wagner joins me now watching the trial this week. What's going through your mind? Well, there's a couple things going through my mind, but the biggest ones are he really needs a lawyer. That's the first one. And the second one is the judge has the patience of Job. It's astonishing that she has been able to keep an even keel throughout his antics. And I'll say that today, her demeanor toward him seems to have paid off. Because today, he's been acting calm, he's been organized, he's been directed, and he's not acted out yet in front of the jury. He's in the courtroom today. And for clarity, we're taping on Friday morning. How does a judge handle that? Talk, like, how does a judge keep control of a courtroom and a defendant in this kind of absolutely unpredictable scenario? Uh, so I'm an adventurer, guess. I'm going to guess that up until the actual jury selection started this week and last week, the judge didn't expect him to be quite as poorly behaved as he was. And I'm thinking that she was taken a little aback. That showed in her exasperation in the first couple of days. But it seems like she's worked really hard on trying to treat him in a human fashion, treat him like the person he is and not judge him in any way so that he feels respected and returns the favor. And it, I'll say this, it's paying off, but it's a challenge. Most judges would not be this patient, and most judges would uh, probably have gotten angry on the record in front of the jury by now. So she's done a remarkable job, Judge Doral. And it appears that she's a bit restrained in terms of the choices she's using. For example, like she would, there's the option to potentially gag a defendant if possible. She hasn't taken that. There seems to be that she's kind of keeping herself from some of those more extreme measures. Okay, so the, the option to, to gag somebody goes back to well before the age of the internet, and we certainly didn't have Zoom or remote video. That was the only alternative a judge had in order to have a defendant present for a trial. And if you take the risk of somebody who's representing himself being removed from the courtroom altogether, you essentially, you don't just deny him the right to represent himself, you strip away the meaning of the Sixth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment says you have the right to question witnesses, make arguments, make objections. So she's taken advantage of modern technology. In fact, today she repeated those rulings and noted that Zoom and remote video allow her to do things that uh, in, in previous years they couldn't. But the most famous trial where somebody was bound and gag was Bobby Seale in the Chicago 7 after the Democratic National Convention way back when um, uh, Kennedy was nominated. And in that case, he was ultimately held in contempt and jailed for that, but that's what he did. He sat in court bound and gagged, literally. So she's done a good job. Do we have anything to compare this week? Obviously, we don't know what's going to come next in the jury. Again, he appears calm this morning, but this, as well, far as this past week, anything to compare it to historically? You know, nothing really comes to mind. There are many instances where litigants, uh, criminal defendants, people accused, act in inappropriate ways in a courtroom. I mean, I've, I've seen everything. I've seen people get up and uh, relieve themselves in the courtroom. I've seen people get up and have to be escorted out. But this is kind of unique. This is a novel situation, and that's why I say, you know, oftentimes you see a judge or a prosecutor in the limelight of a nationally covered case, and they, they give in to the pressure. Judge Doro and the DA have been very steadfast in keeping the record clean. Brooks has been several times cleared in terms of mental competency. Put yourself in his, uh, not his shoes, but let's say you're his criminal defense attorney. He's behaving this way in court. What do you do? Well, first of all, I haven't had that happen, so I'm going to be venturing some speculation here. Sure. But if I have a client who starts acting up in court, I'm going to ask for a recess. 
and I am going to explain to the client how this is going to affect the jury and if his goal or her goal is to have the jury give him the fairest shake at trial, you're going to have to act like a grown-up. And if you don't, they're going to hold it against you. And it doesn't hurt me, but it really hurts you. If that doesn't work, I would probably suggest to the judge in this day and age that my client be allowed to participate in the proceedings by Zoom, that I have a separate Zoom channel to use with them while I sit in the courtroom, and then I ask for a private Zoom room, as they call it, or breakout room, when needed to communicate with him and then take more frequent breaks. I, I, I don't think there's a better solution. Technology, for once, is actually a good thing. What, what do we think in terms of the jury as they watch this? So, that, that, you know... They've seen some of this behavior leading up to this, but now that we're into the actual trial, how do they reckon this new, you know, potentially new Mr. Brooks with his behavior before? Well, obviously, they're going to be instructed again at the end of the case that they're to judge only the facts that are put on the record. So from that perspective, in this case, uh, it, it's, not a, it's not a stretch to say that the facts are overwhelming. This is not a case that any lawyer could come in and expect to prevail on all of the uh, homicide charges. Whatever else there is there, and there's dozens of counts, uh, there are people who died, there's video of what happened, he's almost certainly bound to be convicted of homicide, multiple counts. That being said, I think the jury's reaction is probably going to affect them most if he decides to testify in his own defense. If he does, they're going to remember how he acted because we can't help it. We're human. You watch somebody act in a certain way for a couple of days and then suddenly they flip a switch and they seem better and under control. When they get on the stand, the first thing the jury's going to think is he's trying to fool us by being smart, intelligent, and sincere just like he did on day three. But on days one and two, we saw another side of him. So they're going to have real questions about the veracity of any testimony he gives. Sensitive question here. Brooks is representing himself, which means potentially he's going to be then cross-examining families of victims. I mean, that's a tough situation in a courtroom. How, how does that shake out? Well, if today is any uh, sign, he's going to be able to do it in some respectful fashion. He continues to refer to himself as the alleged defendant or Mr. Brooks, and that will make it easier for them. Uh, for them to have to confront the person who killed their loved one when they do identifications or eyewitness testimony, it's going to be both scary and enraging. And so if he continues to hang, hang on to this sort of level, lawyer-like tone and approach, he was even saying to the judge this morning, I'm not interrupting, am I? Things like that. If he acts that way, it will probably make it easier for the witnesses who testify on behalf of the people who passed away and who were injured. But boy, um, if he goes the other way, this is what I worry about. If he suddenly goes back to acting in the boorish and uncontrollable fashion he was, he will not be allowed to conduct the examinations. And at one point, the judge did say yesterday that you, I may bar you from cross-examination. This is where the lawyer in me really worries. Because the Sixth Amendment right to counsel, it can be waived. But the Sixth Amendment guarantee of a fair trial includes the guarantee of confrontation. And if you're the lawyer and the accused and you can't conduct it because the judge says, no, your behavior bores it, the judge is almost left with a, with a Hobson's choice, which is do I let him continue and act in this way or do I have somebody come in and do it for him if I can find anybody at this late date or do I cut it off? And that to me would be the greatest issue on appeal. So if the families are hoping that this is the one time they try the case, which I think may have been in the back of the judge's mind, get it done before the one-year anniversary. I don't know. That's a surmise on my part. But if that's their hope, that we do this once and get it over with, I will say this. Grief cannot begin until the justice system is done. It's really put on hold, and it's terrible. Once they move forward, they don't want it to come back. So if he goes that way, the judge is going to have to craft something that none of us have ever had to do. Those are my suggestions, but none of them are good choices. Incredibly difficult situation. Well, I'm, we'll be watching with interest as it plays out. Chris, thank you so much for your time. We will be right back.